Hello, YouTube. It's me again. And you are tuned in to The Artful Codger Show on BRTV. And I'm your host, The Artful Codger. We're going to finish up what we started some time ago by reading the last chapter of The Art of Pipe Smoking Pleasure by J. Leland Brown. The last chapter being titled The Technique of Smoking a Pipe. Let's see here. Starts with a poem. The Weed. Fill up the pipe and touch the flaming match. The swallows twitter neath the dripping thatch. But bravely leaps the blaze within. And while the joy is ours, let's troll a lilting catch. Ah, sweet content, here is thy mild abode. In clouds of smoke we slip each weary load of dire responsibility and dread and carefree frolic on delight's high road. Fill up the pipe, this joy remains the same. The weed's a mistress that can ne'er grow tame. She never pauses nor solace e'er denies to prince or pauper, to the fleet or lame. A few good friends, a seat beside the fire, a well-filled pouch at hand, and pipe of briar, and in the heart of lo a love of all mankind, an age is not catastrophe so dire. Fill up the pipe, and let me dream again of youth's ambitions, bauble-like and vain. So mellow are the memories that I, without a bitter thought, review and train. For nearly all is vain to which we cling, wealth, power, fame, success, whate'er the ring. Tis base is min metal, even love so fair is far more vain than any other thing. Fill up the pipe, here vanity must end. Turkish, Perique, Virginia, sweetly blend with Latakia and Havana too, and each to each new excellent doth lend. The weed turned ashes quickly is forgot, but joyously it yields its fragrant lot. Also man lives and dies and turns to dust, but all in rollicking good cheer. Why not? This then our cue to sweetly emulate tobacco and its democratic state, to give of comfort wheresoe'er we may and love all men and leave the rest to fate. And some far day, if I should chance to be marooned on barren rock and sad salt sea, where th this thrice blessed weed may never grow, fill up the pipe and smoke the pipe for me by Kirk Lachelle all right the technique of smoking a pipe you may have the best pipe available and you may load it with an excellent tobacco but if you do not know how to wield a pipe correctly the results obtained will be far from the best the problem of handling a pipe is treated under the following headings Breaking in, smoking, cleaning, coloring, and repairing. Breaking in a pipe. The method of breaking in a pipe outlined below is intended for a pipe that has a bowl made from organic materials. The same principles apply for breaking in pipes with bowls made from inorganic substances. However, since inorganic materials are not combustible, the step which calls for immersing the bowl in water should be eliminated. Employing the proper method of breaking in a new pipe is the most important feature for future smoking pleasure. A pipe that embodies the fundamental principles of good smoking qualities can be rendered useless by careless or misguided treatment during the breaking in process. By adhering to the principles outlined below, a good pipe will certainly and quickly become a good smoker. First, remove the varnish and dust from the interior of the bowl by wiping thoroughly with a cloth liberally soaked in pure grain alcohol. If the pipe has a virgin finish, this step is not necessary except to remove any wood fuzz or dust that may serve as a fuse for a burnout. If you've been saddled with a varnished pipe, be careful not to let the alcohol come in contact with the outside of the bowl. On the other hand, the pipe will perform better if the varnish is entirely removed. 
However, its appearance will become somewhat less lustrous, and the flaws that the varnish is designed to conceal will be exposed. Next, soak the pipe for about one hour in a tumbler partly filled with clear, cool water. Stand the pipe upright in the tumbler so, so that only the pipe head is immersed. Caution. Do not let the shank become wet, nor do not attempt to remove the bit from the shank. This procedure may crack the shank. By thoroughly impregnating the porous inner bowl walls with moisture, the tendency for the uncaked bowl to char or burn will be nullified. After an hour of continuous soaking, the bowl can be removed from the bath. Shake the excess, the ex, <laughs> shake the excess moisture from the bowl and wipe the outside dry. Thoroughly dry the air hole by ramming the stem with a pipe cleaner. Immediately fill the bowl with your favorite tobacco. Use the same kind of tobacco throughout the breaking in process. Make certain that the tobacco granules are of uniform size. This can be accomplished best by vigorously rubbing enough tobacco for several pipefuls between the palms of the hands. The uniform tobacco will ensure a steady and uniform burn. This will assure the start of a uniform cake and will further reduce the possibility of charring or otherwise damaging the bowl. Fill the bowl completely, but with as little pressure as possible. Do not let tobacco shreds hang over the rim of the bowl. Before lighting the pipe, be certain that you are not in a strong draft of air. Air currents may cause the tobacco to burn unevenly and may start a faulty cake or cause the bowl to char. Use kitchen matches to light the pipe during the breaking in process. After striking the match, sorry. After striking the match, let the sulfur be entirely consumed before applying the flame to the tobacco. This will prevent the sulfur from spoiling the taste of the smoke. Apply the match flame to the entire surface of the tobacco and draw very gently until it is completely aglow. Then let the pipe go out and gently pack down the partly consumed ash with, toba with a tobacco stopper. Relight as before. Smoke very slowly and evenly. Under no circumstance let the pipe become hot. It will have a greater tendency to do so during the first few pipefuls. When it does so, let it go out and cool off before relighting. Use several matches to ensure that all of the tobacco in the pipe has been consumed but be particularly careful not to disturb the ash clinging to the inner walls of the bowl. After the first pipeful has been completely consumed, allow the pipe to cool and then gently knock out the excess ash. Do not try to remove the ash left in the bottom of the bowl. Refill the pipe and smoke as before. Continue this process for five or six pipefuls. After completely smoking the first few pipefuls, Gently remove the ash from the walls and bottom of the bowl with a bent pipe cleaner. The use of a more rigid instrument for this operation may damage the new cake. Now smoke a quarter of a pound of tobacco with the same bowl filled only one quarter full. Next, smoke the same amount of tobacco at the one half and the three quarters mark. The chamber will now have a uniform cake from heel to rim and the pipe will be ready for regular service. Now let us look into the matter of the pipe that has been in use for some time. Many are in possession of pipes that embody the superior qualities of smoking's excellence. All too frequently, these pipes fail to give good performance. They fail to live up to the expectations of their owners. What is wrong? Many smokers have pet theories as to the proper methods to be employed in pipe initiation. Regardless of the method employed, it is the result that counts. The result most inducive to the great smoking enjoyment, to the greatest smoking enjoyment, is illustrated and described below. The ideal cake. The cake should develop in uniform thickness on the bowl wall. 
Since the cake is an extremely porous substance, there should be no discontinuity. Discontinuity. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's more than one that I've goofed up today. All right. There should be no discontinuity. God, discontinuity. <laughs> Not even over the opening where the air hole pierces the chamber. The greatest fault of the poorly performing pipe is invariably the absence of a uniform cake in the immediate region of the heel. This is an unavoidable result of not smoking the pipe completely out, particularly during the breaking in process. Examine the heel of your pipes that have been in regular service. The ones having little or no cake in the heel are sure to be poor smokers. It is impossible to smoke them completely out without experiencing a disgusting, acrid taste as the tobacco burns further and further down the bowl. The tendency is to dump the pipe before it is smoked out, wasting considerable unburned tobacco. In addition, a complete cake will never form within the heel. It is, the f it is a fault that breeds on itself. The cure is as follows. Carefully ream out the pipe. Make certain that as much of the cake is removed as possible. If the heel is absolutely devoid of cake, i.e., if the bare surface of the pipe chamber is exposed, it may be desirable to smoke the, pool, the bowl in pure grain alcohol. The faulty cake can then be completely removed from the chamber. When the cake has been removed and the pipe has been allowed to dry, the pipe can be treated as a new one. In this case, the directions outlined above apply and are strongly recommended in starting and keeping a cake. If the pipe conforms in design and construction to the basic principles previously indicated, then it can be made to accept a correctly formed cake and, sm and a smoking pleasure is assured. Smoking a pipe. Before filling a pipe, test its draw. Occasionally, the air holes become clogged, rendering the pipe unsmokable when it is filled. If this fault is discovered before the pipe is filled, it can be corrected with little difficulty by ramming the stem with a pipe cleaner. If the pipe becomes clogged while smoking, alternate blowing and drawing on the bit will frequently remove the obstruction. An important feature in pleasurable smoking is the proper filling of the pipe. Fill the pipe a little bit at a time. Pay particular attention to tamping around the edges of the tobacco near the bowl wall. The tendency is to tamp the tobacco too tightly, particularly in the center of the chamber, away from the bowl walls. This will cause the flame to travel down the sides of the chamber, leaving the central column of tobacco only partly consumed. If the tobacco is tamped too lightly, it will burn hot and if it is tamped too loosely, it will not burn well. The faster the individual smoker consumes a pipe full of tobacco, the looser the tobacco should be tamped. Find by experimentation the way in which tamping the tobacco is most adaptable to your manner of smoking. Once the pipe has been filled satisfactorily, it is, the equally, important, it is equally important that it be properly lighted. Any number of cigarette lighters are readily adaptable to lighting a pipe. Safety matches do not burn long enough to adequately light a pipe. Kitchen matches are the best and most reliable pipe lighters. They also exemplify the prime rec prerequisite of a good pipe lighter, the broad, long-lasting flame. When the pipe has been filled and is drawing easily, Apply the flame of the match or lighter to the entire exposed surface of the tobacco. The hottest part of the flame is somewhere near its apex, so do not hold the match or lighter too near the tobacco. Also, be careful not to scorch the rim of the bowl. As mentioned before, do not apply a match before the sulfur has been entirely consumed or the taste of the entire bowl of tobacco will be ruined. Draw very gently so that the on, so that only so the, that only the upper surface of the tobacco is ignited. 
Then let the tobacco go out, tamp down the partly consumed tobacco ash, and relight as before. The entire surface of the tobacco will now be a glowing ember, and the pipe can be smoked out completely without relighting. If you smoke a very rough cut tobacco that is hard to light, the following procedure is recommended. Save a few ashes from the last pipeful. Place these ashes on top of the fresh load. The pipe can then be lighted without any trouble. Some smokers find that they have a tendency to spit into the bit during the lighting operation. This trouble can be avoided by holding the pipe stem horizontal while lighting. Try relighting a pipe that has gone out before emptying the ashes. Since a pipe will go out if not drawn on occasionally, there may still be, whoopsie, there we go, there may still be some unused tobacco left in the chamber. If you repeatedly dump out the heel before smoking it out, you will eventually produce a heel that is not correctly caked. You will then be troubled with a wet heel that gurgles and sputters in an annoying way. Also, when the condition gets very bad, you cannot smoke the pipe out entirely without encountering a vile taste as the tobacco in the heel starts to burn. If time does not permit smoking all of the tobacco in the chamber, do not dump out the unburned tobacco but only the loose white ash on top. Then blow out any smoke left in the pipe to prevent it from becoming stale. When the pipe is taken up again, it can be relighted and will continue to smoke sweetly. The pipe is an instrument that can only be smoked satisfactorily in a leisurely manner. The more slowly you smoke, the cooler your smoke will be. Try to draw on a pipe only hard enough to keep it lighted Drawing too deeply or too frequently will surely overheat the bowl. Should this happen, lay the pipe aside until it has cooled off. This can be done without impairing the taste of the smoke if the pipe is blown clear before laying it aside. Hold the pipe bowl in your hand while smoking. You can then tell immediately when it is becoming overheated. Should you be the type of smoker who languidly and leisurely draws on the pipe, and carries this to such an extent that the pipe frequently goes out, the tobacco can be kept burning by occasionally puffing the smoke back through the pipe. If this is not sufficient, if this is not sufficient cure for the faulty pipe, there are several adulterants mentioned in Chapter 2 that will improve the burn of tobacco. It is not advisable to keep continually changing the kind of tobacco smoked. In the first place, a new tobacco smoked for the first time in an old pipe will not give off its true aroma for almost a dozen pipefuls. Therefore, it is impossible to use a well-caked pipe in judging a new tobacco. In the second place, a new tobacco will produce a cake that does not cling well to the old cake. It will chip off, resulting in an undesirably rough chamber. When the pipe has been completely smoked out, it should be emptied immediately. If the burned ash is left in the pipe, it will prevent moisture that unavoidably, unavoidably collects in the bed in the heat. I'm sorry. It will prevent moisture that unavoided, unavoidably collects in the heel and air hole from evaporating by limiting or excluding the circulation of air. Also, a pipe left lying around or placed in the pocket unemptied is generally inadvertently tipped over scattering ashes or burning embers which are a nuisance or even a fire hazard. To empty the pipe, hold it by the bowl or by the shank near the bowl. This will prevent breaking the bit, tenon, or the shank. Tap the bowl rim gently against the knocker in an ashtray or against any other soft surface. This will prevent scarring or otherwise damaging the bowl. Avoid loosening or removing the cake as the pipe is emptied. For this reason, do not use any sort of instrument for emptying the pipe. When the tobacco ash is completely removed, blow on the bit several times to expel excess moisture from the air hole, thus expediting the evaporation. Never refill and relight the pipe until it has had an opportunity to cool off and dry out. 
Also, relieve your pipe between smokes if possible. A fundamental principle of pipe smoking, as akin to cigar smoking and different from cigarette smoking, is never to inhale. If you are a well-adjusted pipe smoker and have a blend or mixture of tobacco suited to your temperament, you will get the full benefit from your tobacco through the taste sense alone. The tobacco should be strong enough so that it is uncomfortable to inhale. Remember that the stronger a tobacco is, the richer it will be in essential oils and resins, and the cooler it will burn. Another important principle of an accomplished pipester is to smoke dry. This takes considerable conscious effort and may even require a specially built bit. It is an artifice that can be mastered. Only then will you fully enjoy your pipe. Moisture can get into the bit, shank, and heel of your pipe from two sources. When tobacco is in high order, it contains considerable moisture. As the tobacco is burned within your pipe bowl, this moisture is turned into steam and passes through the pipe stem along with other gases in the form of smoke. Some of these gases condense on the inner walls of the stem. However, the most prevalent source of moisture within... Within the pipe is saliva from the smoker's mouth. The amount of moisture from this source can be reduced by keeping the lip end of the bit out of the trough behind the teeth and by swallowing infrequently. By swallowing frequently. That's a mouthful. <laughs> Whenever there is an excess of moisture within the pipe stem, there will be trouble. Not only will the pipe gurgle and sputter annoyingly, but it will develop a bitter taste and produce a vile odor. This effect can be minimized by smoking dryly and by smoking drier tobaccos. If these precautions are combined with frequent purging of the stem, the deleterious effects of excess moisture can be eliminated. This brings us to the all-important subject of the proper care of the pipe. If given improper treatment, a pipe will not perform in the most satisfactory manner, regardless of its ancestry. Cleaning a pipe A pipe must be kept clean. The tobacco you smoke may produce a disagreeable aroma. This fault can be remedied by changing to a more suitable blend. However, if the pipe is not cleaned regularly and thoroughly, any tobacco will become offensive. The primary principle in keeping a pipe clean and in its best smoking condition is not to smoke it too frequently nor too long. Avoid becoming so attached to a particular pipe in your collection that you smoke it exclusively. Divide the smoking burden equally among all of your pipes. If one pipe seems to have more appeal than the rest, try to duplicate this pipe exactly. This will lessen the tendency to overwork a particular pipe. To avoid concentrating on a particular pipe or group of pipes, keep your collection stored in a place that is not too readily accessible. Each morning, select the pipe or pipes for use that day. At the end of the day, clean the duty pipes and return, return them to their respective places in the collection. Not until the rest of the entire collection have had a full day of smoking service should these pipes be used again. If you are a slow smoker and untroubled with overheated bowls, you can smoke the same pipe continuously for a whole day without overworking the pipe. However, if you have a tendency to smoke too rapidly, it is best to alternate between two pipes during the smoking day. Resting and relieving a pipe is not sufficient to keep it clean. Periodic cleaning is also essential. Whenever the vaporous smoke comes in contact with the inner surfaces of the pipe, a small amount of the vapor will condense on these inner surfaces. During the pipe's rest periods, moisture from this condensate will evaporate into the air, but a residue composed of the tars, oils, and resins produced by the burning tobacco will remain. It is this distilled solid that makes the pipe smelly. The moisture evaporating from this residue is the smell. The actual cleaning procedures should be classified as follows. Cleaning measures while smoking, 
cleaning measures after a day's smoking, cleaning measures after a week's smoking, and cleaning measures after a month's smoking. The actual cleaning times depend upon the amount that a particular pipe has been smoked. This directive will aptly apply to the average pipe. Cleaning measures while smoking. Dump out the burned tobacco when the pipe, t burned tobacco ash, when the pipe has been entirely smoked out by gently tamping the rim of the bowl against some resilient surface. Do not damage the cake within the bowl by digging with a knife blade or similar instrument. Blow a sharp blast of breath through the pipe to expel moisture and tobacco slugs from the air hole, being careful not to spit into the stem. Do not open the pipe unless a slug has become jammed into the air hole. Frequently, this trouble can be remedied by burning out the offending particle of tobacco before the pipe is refilled. Should the draft become completely blocked, exercise extreme caution in removing the obstruction for the cake in the bottom of the bowl can be easily damaged. Use a pipe cleaner to ram the air hole clear. An implement such as a stick or straw may break off in the pipe, thus compounding the difficulty. Never handle the pipe with soiled hands, nor lay the pipe down in a contaminated place. Never place the pipe in an ashtray where the surface of the bowl can come in contact with burning tobacco. As a sanitary precaution, be careful not to allow the lip of the bit to come in contact with other material. When not in use, endeavor to stand the pipe so that the stem points upward. This will cause the moisture trapped in the stem to flow into the chamber, where it will be exposed to a greater quantity of air, greatly expediting the dehydration of heel and stem. This will also keep moisture from running down to the lip where it can be greatly annoying to the smoker. Cleaning measures after a day's smoking. When a pipe has been smoked for the last time after a day of surface, it should be given a more thorough cleaning. First, open the pipe, but take care to do so when the bowl is cool enough to prevent splitting the shank or breaking the tenon. Then run a pipe cleaner once through the bit, starting the cleaner from the lip. The tenon end of the bit will be more soiled than the lip end. By starting the cleaner from the lip, the bit can be cleaned more effectively. If the bit has a wedge-type lip, make certain that the cleaner comes in contact with the entire inner surface by moving the cleaner from side to side, side as it is pushed through. Do not use a sharp metal instrument to clean out the bit lip. Bits are made from very brittle substances and can be broken or cracked easily. Bits can also be broken easily if more than slight pressure is exerted on them with the teeth. If you, have, if you are troubled with this difficulty, try smoking a very light pipe for a short time. You will soon get out of the habit of clamping down on the bit. When the cleaner has been completely drawn through the bit, it should be unsoiled except for the section that passed through the bit first. Using the unsoiled end of the cleaner, swab out the air hole in the shank. If the air hole is not large enough or is not entirely free from obstruction, the restricted orifice will give the smoke an increased velocity as it passes down the stem. This will cause the smoke to impinge against the tip of the tongue and will manifest itself in a biting or burning sensation. When the pipe has been reassembled, it is ready for its rest period. Under no circumstances leave a pipe cleaner in the stem of the pipe. If the air hole of the pipe is to dry out, the air must have as little interference as possible in coming in contact with the moistened inner workings of the pipe. The air will circulate through the bowl and stem of the pipe, carrying out moisture only if it has an unrestricted passage. Cleaning measures after a week's smoking. After the pipe has been smoked for about seven days, the cleaning procedure outlined above may not be sufficient to remove the accumulation of solid matter within the interior of the stem. It will eventually become necessary to cleanse the draft thoroughly. The bit can be effectively cleaned by ramming with a cleaner dipped in soapy water. It is then advisable to dry the draft with a fresh cleaner. 
The air hole in the shank must also be given further attention. Do not use soap and water here. First swab with a dry pipe cleaner, and then ram the air hole with a round rod that exactly fits the bore of the air hole. Such an instrument must be provided for this specific purpose. It may be desirable to have the air holes of all your pipes re-drilled so that one such tool will suffice for the entire collection. Next, clean the mortise by wiping it with a piece of tissue paper or cloth. Special wire brushes for this particular purpose may be procured. If you are a wet smoker or if your tobacco has been exceptionally moist, the pipe may have developed a particularly bad disposition. When a pipe tastes especially acrid, it will be necessary to use a pipe sweetening fluid. Only pure grain alcohol or a prepared sweetener with a pure grain alcohol base should be used. You can make your own pipe sweetener by mixing oil of clove or oil of wintergreen with pure grain alcohol. Dip a cleaner into this solution and run it through the bit and shank. Do not press this pipe into service until it has had an opportunity to dry out completely. The most deplorable condition can be remedied dramatically, and the pipe will once again become a pleasant performer. Of course, all of this is based on the assumption that you are smoking a pipe and not an abominable piece of slick sales talk. <laughs> Cleaning measures after a month's smoking. After the pipe has had 30 days service, it is in need of a general overhaul. Some may prefer to send their pipes to a mechanic specializing in pipe repairing. However, here are the general defects most in need of attention and providing the equipment is available, they can be corrected by the smoker at the expense of a little time. The first step is cleaning the inside of the pipe using the methods just described. At this time, it will probably be necessary to go one step further. The pipe chamber will have probably have to be reamed. During the smoking process, a residue from the burning tobacco condenses on the inner wall of the bowl. The heat generated by the burning tobacco bakes this residue into a hard film on the inner bowl wall. This cake is highly porous and its existence greatly influences the quality of the smoke. The bare wall of a virgin pipe does not produce a satisfactory smoke. Only when the chamber has become lined with a uniform cake does the pipe develop its characteristic sweet smoking qualities. The existence of this cake engenders disadvantages as well as advantages. The cake will continue to form as long as the pipe is smoked. If this residue is allowed to develop unchecked, it will eventually completely fill the chamber. This reduces the volume of the chamber and increases the weight of the bowl. These disadvantages are minor when compared to the other real danger involved. The cake forms an extremely hard ring within the chamber. Since it is nearer to the heat from the burning tobacco, and since it has a coefficient of expansion greater than any of the materials used in pipe head construction, the cake expands more than the pipe bowl. If the cake is thick enough, its greater expansion will produce stresses within the pipe bowl sufficient to crack or split the bowl walls. Any pipe will be safe from this difficulty if the thickness of the cake is not allowed to exceed one quarter of the thickness of the bowl wall. The cake can be removed from the bowl most effectively by using one or another of the various types of pipe reamers sold in any pipe store. If the two-legged spring type reamer is used, it can be adjusted to fit any size or style of pipe. A reamer is superior to a knife blade in that it makes possible the removal of excess cake, leaving a cake shell of uniform thickness. Any sharp pointed instrument such as a knife blade also increases the possibility of damaging the cake or scarring and exposing the bare material of the bowl. This may result in the beginning of a burnout. The bowl should not be reamed until the cake has had an opportunity to become thoroughly dry and of a uniform hardness. 
Care should be exercised not to remove the cake entirely from any part of the bowl interior. This is particularly easy to do at the very bottom of the bowl. The area where it is so important to have a proper cake and where recaking is particularly difficult. After the cake has been removed, loose particles of pulverized cake will be left clinging to the chamber. They can be removed by sweeping the chamber out with a small brush. Now, all right. Now for cleaning and brightening up the outer surfaces of the briar pipe. If the bit has been exposed to the direct rays of the sun, it will have lost its glossy jet black luster. This can be restored by scouring the bit with bone ami and then lukewarm water. Considerable dirt can be removed from the bowl by subjecting it to the same process. The cake that overflows from the chamber onto the rim of the bowl can be removed with a cloth saturated with pure grain alcohol. Avoid getting the alcohol on the exterior of the bowl if it is finished with varnish. If your pipe has become scarred after suffering some misfortune or ill treatment, the offending spot can be rendered less noticeable by staining. Iodine can be used for stain if the necessary wood stain is not available. The luster of the pipe can be increased or restored by polishing with a piece of flannel cloth dipped in a small amount of glycerin. If you are fortunate enough to have a polishing head in your workshop, this process can be greatly facilitated. Pure beeswax applied with a flannel polishing head will not only enhance the beauty of the pipe, but will improve its smoking qualities. Occasionally, the exterior of a Meerschaum pipe must be refurbished. This can be accomplished as follows. Use a piece of flannel cloth moistened with glycerin to polish the amber bit. Caution, never use alcohol to polish amber. Amber is partially soluble in alcohol. After the Meerschaum bowl has been carefully reamed, wash the external surfaces with soap and water. Use as little water as is practicable. and a pure, ungritty soap. Next, apply a little oxalic acid to the outside of the bowl and shank with a cloth. Then place the pipe head in an oven where the temperature is 140 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. When the Meerschaum has completely cooled, rub the outer surfaces with a split twig of scatchel balm that has been moistened with water. This will impart a finish which cannot be obtained otherwise. Next, boil the pipe in refined beeswax for 10 minutes. When the bowl has cooled, polish it with cotton flannel and powdered chalk. Finally, highlight the luster of the bowl by polishing it with a piece of flannel saturated with pure grain alcohol. Yes. As if Meerschaums weren't fussy enough, huh? Your hands may become soiled with a brownish-yellow stain while you are smoking or cleaning your pipe. This stain can be removed as follows. Wash the hands with soap and water. Then rub the soiled spot with a piece of pumice stone. When the hands are rinsed, the stain will disappear. The stain is not nicotine. It is the tars distilled from the burning tobacco. Pure nicotine is a transparent compound. Coloring a pipe there is little that can be done in the way of controlling the coloring of a briar or clay. They will darken uniformly with use. Special precautions need not be exercised to prevent undesirable results. The coloring of a Meerschaum, however, is a long and tedious process requiring much skill and patience. The uniqueness, beauty, and superior smoking qualities are responsible for the exalted position of a well-colored Meerschaum. If you desire to be among the numbered few possessing such pipes, proceed as follows when breaking in a new Meerschaum. Procure the Meerschaum bowl from a discarded calabash pipe. It can be obtained from any pipe repair shop. Fit this auxiliary bowl onto the rim of the subject pipe. A small amount of carving on the discarded bowl may be necessary to ensure a satisfactory fit. The carving will be facilitated if the bowl is soaked in water for 10 minutes. Fasten the edge of an 
bowl to the subject pipe by means of plaster of Paris. The plaster of Paris seal should contact the subject pipe only on the rim of the bowl. During the entire breaking in period, carefully prevent anything from coming in contact with the outside surface of the pipe. Do not even touch it with the fingers. The meerschaum is especially soft and can be easily marred or soiled. It may be advisable to sew a chamois jacket around the bowl to prevent such an injury. However, it is far better to avoid this practice. Any covering will absorb some of the wax with which the bowl has been impregnated. This uncontrolled and irregular removal of the wax will cause spotty coloring. When the seal has set and hardened, fill the upper bowl with tobacco and light the pipe. In addition to the precautions mentioned, it is of vital importance to avoid heating the subject bowl. Heat closes the pores of the meerschaum, excluding the color producing constituents in the tobacco vapor. Therefore, smoke slowly and keep out of drafts. The false upper bowl is employed to prohibit heat from the burning tobacco, having direct access to the coloring meerschaum. This procedure should be followed until the bowl has acquired the color desired. The time required to color a pipe depends entirely upon the amount of smoking, the quality of the meerschaum, and the kind of tobacco used. The higher the quality of the meerschaum, the quicker it will attain the coveted tint. The time required for coloring can be greatly reduced by employing tobaccos with a high volatile oil content. When the desired depth of color has been achieved, it is possible to set or fix this particular tint permanently. It is de desirable to do so because continued smoking in the regular way will deepen the color irregularly. To hold this tint permanently, employ the process outlined below for artificially coloring meerschaum, but do not use the dyes. Not all meerschaum pipes can be colored naturally. The smoker may become impatient, make some mistake, or the pipe may suffer some mishap. Some meerschaum will not adapt itself to the coloring process. If you are in possession of a meerschaum pipe that has not been evenly colored, it is possible to correct this fault. The pipe can be colored artificially in the following manner. First, remove the bit and clean the bowl thoroughly inside and out using pure grain alcohol. This includes complete removal of the cake. Place the pipe head in an oven where the temperature is about 140 degrees Celsius for one hour. This will bake the wax, moisture, or other superfluous juices out of the bowl. Allow the bowl to cool in the open air and then remove all scratches or dents. This can be accomplished by applying by applying number zero pumice stone to the meerschaum surfaces and rubbing with cotton flannel moistened in linseed oil. Next, dampen the outside surfaces of the meerschaum with oxalic acid. This will open the pores of the bowl. It should be allowed to dry for a few hours and then be treated again with oxalic acid. Then, stop up the chamber with a cork and plug the air hole with plaster of Paris. Next, take equal parts of the aniline dyes, oxblood and Sudan brown, and mix them into a thick paste with linseed oil. Spread the paste on the outside surfaces of the meerschaum bowl and shank as evenly and thinly as possible. Now, burn the paste into the pipe head by holding it over an alcohol lamp. Any particular hue can be selected by the operator. Uniformity and depth of color can be controlled with practice. When the pipe has been allowed to cool, rub the outer surfaces lightly with rotten stone and polish with a damp piece of co cotton flannel. A meerschaum pipe can be colored artificially by this simpler process if you will tolerate less realistic results. Boil the head of the pipe for 12 minutes in a solution composed of one part crude nicotine, two parts olive oil, and eight parts yellow wax. When the bowl has cooled, rub it lightly with powdered chalk and polish with cotton flannel. I think they meant yeah, that rotten stone cotton flannel. With cotton flannel that has been immersed in pure grain alcohol. Thanks, guys. I think I'll stick to briar. All right. Uh, repairing a pipe. Any pipe smoker with 
some mechanical ability can make pipe repairs to correct the general difficulties encountered. With a limited amount of equipment and experience, the novice can become an expert in a short time. A smoker can save money and is able not only to restore his pipes to usefulness more quickly, but frequently better than the average pipe repair service. A simple repair outfit should consist of the following tools and materials. A flat, smooth-edged file, a rat-tail file, a three-cornered file, several short sections of stiff wire ranging in size from number 9 to number 24, a small gimlet or an assortment of wood screws, a 3 16th inch wood drill, a pocket knife, some very fine sandpaper and emery cloth, plaster of Paris, gum Arabic, and a pair of pliers. If you happen to have a lathe or polishing head, so much the better. Oops, excuse me. There we are. It will probably be advisable to have a variety of molded pipe bits on hand. They can be obtained from a bit manufacturer or a pipe repair shop for a few cents each. The tenons of these bits should be unturned. A pipe bit is the element most susceptible to disorder. The common trouble is with the fit between bit and shank. A loose fit can be corrected as follows. Heat a shallow pan of water to the boiling point. Immerse the undersized tenon in the water for about three minutes. The tenon will become pliable and can be increased in diameter by pressing flat against a flat, rigid surface. While the tenon is still under pressure, cool it with cold water. Dry the bit and try it in the mortise of the shank. If it is still too small, repeat the process. If the tenon is too large, heat and insert it in the mortise before it has an opportunity to cool. The fit of a slightly oversized tenon can also be improved by lubricating with a soft lead pencil or with talcum powder. Another common trouble encountered is a broken bit lip. It may not always be convenient to replace the bit or to take the pipe to a repair shop. A temporary correction can be effected as follows. Remove the bit from the shank and cut or file the lip of the bit until the damaged section has been removed and squared. Place the bit lip in boiling water for about three minutes. Before it can cool off, cut and spread the end of the bit to form a new lip. The bit may have been reheated several times, may have to be reheated several times, before a lip of sufficient size can be raised. Test your fabricated lip using the teeth as a guide. The new lip should be filed and sanded smooth when enough of a burr has been raised to prevent the pipe from slipping through the teeth. It may not always be possible or desirable to reclaim a broken or damaged bit. In this case, the broken bit must be replaced. To do so, proceed as follows. If the bit has suffered a broken tenon, the tenon will probably have to be removed from the mortise. This can be done by turning a wood screw into the hole in the tenon until the screw cannot be removed without taking the tenon with it. <laughs> Remove the tenon by pulling on the head of the screw with a pair of pliers. If this seems impossible without the danger of breaking the shank, it may be necessary to soak the shank in pure grain alcohol for a few hours. When a tenon has been removed from the mortise, select a new bit to match the outside diameter of the shank. Choose a bit of suitable length for the pipe. Now comes the task of reducing the unturned tenon to fit the mortise of the shank. The bit should be held in a rigid position and in such a manner that the tenon can be cut down into a perfectly round, tube-like shape with a uniform diameter. For those who have a lathe or polishing head, a special jig or chuck can be made or purchased to hold the bit. This equipment will greatly facilitate the precision in turning the tenon to the desired diameter. When the tenon is almost small enough, it should be reduced to the proper diameter first with sandpaper and then with fine emery paper. If the bit is held to the shank by means of a threaded tenon, 
it will be necessary to replace or restore this tenon. The method outlined can also be employed to correct the fit of a bit that overturns. Remove the broken screw-type tenon by inserting a heated wire repeatedly into the draft. This will soften the cement sufficiently to permit the removal of the screw. When the screws are remo- renewed in meerschaum shanks or amber bits, they must be cemented in place. Mix a little gum arabic with plaster of Paris and add enough water to make a thick paste. Apply a small quantity of the cement to the screw and adjust it to the required position. Then allow it to set for several hours to harden thoroughly. Now there is one more small section of this. Uh, it's another f- four pages. We're just going to read it as well. The addendum. What the man with the briar wood says. A pipe of tobacco. Little tube of mighty power, charmer of an idle hour, object of my warm desire, lip of wax and eye of fire, and thy snowy taper waist, with my finger gently braced, and thy pretty swelling crest, with my little stopper pressed, and the sweetest bliss of blisses, breathing from thy balmy kisses. Happy thrice and thrice again, happiest be, happiest he of happy men, who when again the night returns, when again the tamper, taper burns, when again the cricket's gay, little cricket full of play, can afford his tube to feed with the fragrant Indian weed, pleasure for a nose divine, incense of the god of wine, happy thrice and thrice again, happiest he of happy men. Isaac Hawkins Brown, 1736. What the man with the briarwood says. It is but a poor, shallow devotion to tobacco that is content with anything but a pipe. The cigarette is well enough in its way. It may suffice between the acts, or during similar brief escapes from a smokeless world, or for offering to our friends and neighbors as the best modern substitute for the elaborate civility of the snuff-box. But it rises not to the dignity of serious smoking. The cigar, too, with all its charms, leaves something to be desired. It is too ostentatious, too obviously a luxury to be really delightful. It satisfies not, for somehow far away is the ideal cigar, not to be purchased by ordinary mortals, and yet, according to the connoisseur, the only cigar worth smoking. It has, too, an overwhelming suggestion of respectability, of sparing no expense and always traveling first class, of faring sumptuously every day, of wearying a good hat, of wear, oh, I'm sorry, of wearing a very good hat all the week through, and a still better one on Sunday. It should be reserved for special occasions. For ordinary, everyday consumption, there is nothing that can approach the familiar pipe. There are pipes and pipes. Archaic persons are still to be found who declare for the church warden. There is, it is true, something fascinated in its lip of wax and eye of fire and its snowy taper waist with my fingers gently braced. Something also marvelously impressive in its proper manipulation by one who is a master of the art. But this is within the reach of few. It needs its proper surroundings. A blazing fire, a sanded floor, a group of comfortable and, if possible, capacious gentlemen with a strong tendency to silence and punch, none of which are prominent characteristics of modern society. The present-day smoker of the church warden is something of a poser as a rule. He is very young, Eccentricities in pipes are the privilege of the young, being designed to impress those who are still younger, and then, when it has been successfully colored, the labor of months is apt to be destroyed by the implacable housemaid. The old-fashioned smoker was less susceptible to the sorrow of such a calamity as this. He was content to call, like Sir Roger de Corverley, for a clean pipe, 
and apparently cared not for the vanities of coloring. His pipe was but the fortuitous companion of an evening, wedded to him by no enduring ties. Called for at his coffee house as though it was merely a toothpick, to be used but once and then cast away. But now we desire a more permanent alliance. And so the day of the church warden is past, and even its humbler relation, the short clay having the family failing of brittleness, is disappointing. There are devotees of the Mearsham, but it is not everyone who will undertake such a responsibility. Its humors and its delicacy become oppressive. It is not to be knocked out or otherwise roughly treated, nor smoked too fast or too slow. And then, with all our care, we find some happy-go-lucky individual, apparently the especial favorite of the goddess of the weed, who does all these forbidden things and still gets his pipe to a state of perfection, which the more painstaking person attains but in his dreams. There is something distinctly irrational in a Meersham pipe, and yet it will not go right, and then, when we are set at defiance all the canons that the collected wisdom of Meersham smokers has formed, it will assume such color and brilliancy as to be the marvel of all beholders. One is tempted to doubt whether the law of causality applies to Meersham. They have their charms, they may gratify the aesthetic sense with eagles' claws and negroes' heads and skulls and other delightful and fantastic figures, and when brought to perfection may inspire legitimate pride, but they demand too much of sacrifice and tender treatment. Doubtless they are good masters, but they are bad servants. It is not everyone who will submit to their exactions. In the modest briar there is less potentiality of splendor, but still it has graces enough to win for itself the adherence of the great bulk of those who profess the cult of the pipe. There are some indeed who have no eyes for its idiosyncrasies, and being severely utilitarian think all pipes alike. But the connoisseur in briars is a nice and subtle critic. The selection of a new pipe he considers a serious matter. He will tolerate nothing but his favorite grain. He can foresee the possibilities of color and polish. It is not deceived by meretriciousness, meretricious pluggings and varnishing. And his pipes gleam and glitter in the firelight like newly shelled horse chestnuts. It is a thankless thing to present him with a pipe. Indeed, the presentation of smoking implements generally is a perilous practice for the unwary, and one which only feminine ignorance will, as a rule, attempt. The pipe of that class described as suitable for presence is a frightful trap for the well-intentioned. In silver fittings and plush-lined cases it is indeed replendent, resplendent, but it will move the initiate in the cult almost to tears. It is disfigured by all sorts of horrible improvements, has as a rule patent sanitary arrangements of the most complex and unnecessary nature, things which the seasoned smoker cannot tolerate. The choice of a pipe is a thing to be left to the expert, and for him to delegate the office is the highest mark of confidence he can bestow. And the whole thing finishes with this bit. Where there's a will, there's a way. Sir Walter Raleigh's pipe often furnished him with an opening for displaying his ready wit to the queen. One day he was conversing on the singular properties of the new herb. The conversation ran something like this. I assure your majesty, said he, that I can exactly tell the weight of the smoke in any quantity of tobacco I consume. I doubt it much, Sir Walter, replied Elizabeth, thinking only of the impracticability of weighing smoke in a balance, and will wager you twenty angels that you do not resolve my doubt. Raleigh, determined to prov prove himself before his queen, loaded a pipe with tobacco. This he carefully weighed, then he lit the pipe and smoked it out completely. When the last ash had been consumed, 
Raleigh proceeded to weigh the pipe again with equal care. "'Your Majesty,' said he, "'cannot deny that the differences of these weights "'represents that which hath evaporated as smoke.' "'Truly I cannot,' answered the Queen. "'Then turning to those around her, "'who had been amused by Raleigh's calculations, "'she continued, alluding to the alchemists then very numerous, "'Many laborers in the fire have turned their gold into smoke.' But Sir Walter is the first who has turned smoke into gold. <laughs> and that's it, folks. We've now finished this delightful book published in 1946, The Art of Smoking Pleasure by J. Leland Brown. It certainly has its eccentricities and vari variance in opinion compared to what many might tell you today. But if you're like me, you probably found it charming and full of an awful lot of consistencies with the way we enjoy our pipes now. And maybe, just maybe, plenty of great advice for the future. So that's it, guys. Many happy puffs, my friends. I'm going to light my pipe now. And enjoy many happy puffs. I will see you later on the next episode, folks, right here on BRTV. And until then, many happy puffs to you, and good night. <laughs>